What is environmental justice? How does it impact the Erie, Pennsylvania community and the Keystone State as a whole? What can be done and is, be done, is being done to create a future where low-income people and people of color are no longer disproportionately impacted by environmental degradation and pollution? Those are the questions we're gonna to seek to answer here in conversation with three guests. Hello and welcome to a special digital program, a joint effort between the Jefferson Educational Society and Penn Future. I'm Ben Spagan, I'm the Vice President at the Jefferson and I'm a contributing editor at the Erie Reader. Uh, Penn Future and 12 regional organizations joined together to develop Our Water, Our Future, a common agenda for protecting Pennsylvania's Lake Erie watershed. The document prioritizes threats to clean water in the Erie region, and recommend solution at all levels of engagement to ensure that these resources are protected now and for future generations covered in the common agenda, environmental justice. And that's what we'll discuss here with Sarah Bennett, Penn Future Campaign Manager, Gary Horton, Urban Erie CDC President and Erie Chapter NAACP President, and Allison Acevedo, uh, the Director of the Office of Environmental Justice at the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection. Uh, for a fuller bio on each one of these presenters, head over to our website, jesery.org. Uh, folks, uh, before turning it over to our presenters, uh, who will share their insight, their knowledge, their expertise, and their experience, a few programmatic notes. Now, since this is first airing live on the JES Facebook page, we're gonna work our way through as many questions from you, the viewers, as we can as we host this event. If you have a question, just leave it in the comments section below. If you're watching or listening to a later broadcast of this event, still send us your questions, your comments, keep the conversation going, keep engaged with this topic. And of course, for more information about upcoming Jefferson Educational Society programs and publications, please do visit our website, jeserie.org. Be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And for more information about Penn Future, uh, please visit penfutures.org and be sure to find them on all the social platforms too. Now to get us started, I'd like to turn things over to Ms. Sarah Bennett. Sarah, thank you so much for joining us for this discussion and taking the first leg of this presentation. Thank you, Ben, and thanks to the Jefferson for having me again. I'm gonna share my screen here. like we're good. Um, so before I get started, I just want to thank Gary Horton and Al Allison Acevedo for joining us again today. Um, so I'm going to start by just introducing Penn Future and myself. As Ben pointed out, I'm Sarah Bennett, Campaign Manager for Clean Water Advocacy for Penn Future. Penn Future is a statewide environmental advocacy organization dedicated to clean air, water, and land and promoting clean energy and sustainable communities. I wanted to start and Ben kind of introduced us a little bit here. I just want to provide a context for why a water advocate is talking about environmental justice. Um, as Ben pointed out, we just published a common agenda with 12 regional partners in December of 2020. Uh, among the things that we call out, well, the, the ultimate goal is to protect water, but also really to promote a sustainable future for the Erie region. And we know that we cannot have a sustainable future unless everyone has the same opportunities to thrive. And so we made recommendations to address environmental justice concerns. Um, I also wanna point out that we didn't do this work alone. Uh, we wanted to make sure that our call, our, our identification of the problem and also our calls to start addressing the problems uh, were as strong as possible and accurate. So we did include uh, review by three social justice organizations in the region, uh, Erie County United, Green New Deal Coalition of Erie and Meadville, and uh, the U.S. Committee on Refugees and Immigrants of Erie. So one of the occurrences that also contributed to Penn Future's de decision to include environmental justice in a common agenda for Erie, uh, for prote protecting water in Erie, were the activities that led to Erie Coke's closure in 2019. Erie Coke had environmental violations for decades, including illegal levels of benzene, which is a carcinogen, community concerns, and the fact that these areas are, um, that the areas directly surrounding Erie Coke are considered environmental justice areas, prompted enhanced public engagement when Erie Coke was up for permit renewal. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Environmental justice areas, which are highlighted in pink on this, this map, 
um, are defined by the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection as census tracts where 20% of the people, at least 20% of the people living in that tract uh, live below the federal poverty line and or 30% of the people living there are non-white. Among the stakeholders who engaged with the community during this permit renewal process was Hold Erie Coke Accountable. I'll call them HECA from here on out. Um, HECA's goal, initial goal was to bring Erie Coke into compliance. The, the goal was not to close the Erie Coke plant um, initially. And one of the things I wanna highlight here that, that HECA was able to do is that they, helped to engage the community. Um, they attended neighborhood meetings, they developed a website to share information and resources, and also it included a form where residents and other concerned stakeholders could submit those concerns, including pictures and videos that, of what they encountered. Um, what we hopefully have learned um, from the Erie Coke process and also from other occurrences um, since then is that it's not sufficient. A public meeting, just holding a public meeting or even a public hearing um, is really not sufficient community engagement. And we really need to come together as a community to make sure that we find new methods of engagement that center around communities that are most impacted by decisions. If we fast forward to 2020, uh, the un unnecessary deaths of several Black Americans brought renewed attention to ongoing systemic, uh, systemic in in bleh, inequities uh, throughout the country, including Erie County. In September of 2020, Erie County Council declared racism as a public health crisis and committed to openly and honestly addressing racism to eliminate the disparities between black and white people in Erie County. The resolution cites several disparities uh, in aspects of, of life between black and white county residents. I've, I've highlighted a couple of them here, including higher death rates, higher percentages of heart disease and heart attack, higher incidence of COPD and higher obesity rates. Among the many issues that contribute to these disparities is the fact that environmental degradation and pollution disproportionately impact people of color. That's not unique to Erie, that is happening everywhere, but we, we see these health disparities and we know that they are at least partially connected to environmental issues. I also wanna point out that one of the contributing factors to this disproportionate impact is the history of redlining that exists throughout the country. This was a federal home lending policy that categorized neighborhoods by their loan risk based on the race and ethnicity and countries of origin of the people who lived in those neighborhoods. It relegated black, brown and foreign born residents to undesirable and even hazardous neighborhoods. Here we see a, a map of Erie's neighborhoods from 1937 and the, the neighborhoods that we see that are, are actually colored red in this map would be considered, we're, we now call them redlined neighborhoods. This policy ended in the 1960s, but its harmful impacts continue to this day. And this is one example of systemic racism. To tie this back to environmental justice, a scientific article that was published last year in the journal Climate identified that redlined neighborhoods across the country were warmer during their study periods than non-redlined neighborhoods. Erie was included in this study and fits this trend. So this is even further evidence that environmental degradation will continue to disproportionately impact black residents and residents of color. So we have increased awareness due to um, events of 2020. We have evidence to support these disparities and evidence that, that show that those disparities are going to continue. We have a county resolution and we're, we're seeing conversations pop up all over the place about diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice. But what we, so I see momentum here, but what I really want to see is action. 
And so now really is a time to take that momentum and act. Um, within our community, there are a couple of, well, statewide, there's an initiative called EJNPA by the Pennsylvania Environmental Resource Council. And Erie is going to be developing an, an EJ hub. Uh, Gary and I will be working together to develop an EJ hub to continue those conversations in Erie. There's an, uh, another regional group that's working to bring a program to Erie called Undesigning Erie's Red Line. And I'm sure there are a number of other initiatives to start to do this important work to ensure that we have um, a more equitable society that is sustainable and allows everyone to thrive into the future. We also make a few recommendations in the common agenda. Um, among those are a county environmental advisory committee and in we recommend at the municipal le level empowered community advisory committees. And what I mean by empowered is that um, these community advisory committees are made up of people who live in the neighborhoods that they represent. And those advisory committees, um, those advisory committees um, have a say in throughout decision making processes from planning all the way through implementation. No matter what we do, the, the really important thing that we need to do is, is engage in meaningful community engagement and, and make sure that we're not just checking a box to say that we you know, connected with these neighborhoods. So to kind of, we know, it, 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 those of us who live in the Erie region know that Erie is seeking transformative, sustainable change. In order to reach that sustainable change, we need to make sure that we're listening to the people who have historically been impacted. We need to make sure that we engage the residents who will be most impacted by decisions and center decision-making from planning to implementation around those residents. And we need to empower residents to make sure that they have equal seats at decision-making tables. Thank you for that, or thank you for listening. So next I'd like to introduce Gary Horton. Gary is a prominent leader in Erie's community. I've only known him for a short time, but I've learned that he is an incredibly passionate advocate for Erie's black and brown residents. He's already doing the things that I've just spoken of. He's listening, he's engaging, he's empowering. And I'm really honored to be sharing a, a Zoom screen with, with Gary today. Um, so Gary, thank you for joining us. I'm gonna stop my screen here and uh, let you take, take over. Thank you very much. Uh, and I'd like to thank the Jefferson and Penn Future for providing me an opportunity to share your stage today to talk about uh, environmental justice as, as a uh, person um, affected or impacted by in the local environmental community. A lot of what uh, you said, Sarah, and what um, our friend uh, Allison will talk about um, are things that uh, just aren't or, or are beginning to help to happen in Erie. Um, because the environmental challenges that we face uh, aren't just new. Uh, they didn't rise up overnight. And um, we look at the attention that's focused on Erie Coke plant, for instance, as an example that um, has all uh, eyes on Erie Coke as a as the symbol of environmental justice and uh, input or engagement from the community. When to some of us, uh, the Coke plant is just the tip of the iceberg. It's not the iceberg. Um, the things that you showed, the slides that you showed on the red lining, uh, going back to the 1930s, when there weren't a lot of black families in Erie, and how they migrated in the 30s and the 40s and the 50s from the South to Erie and were located in the red line neighborhoods. Um, they've, uh, uh, when environmental justice doesn't work, there's a health cost that's paid. And 
the minority community as it has grown and or um, uh, spread out in the Erie community has been impacted or harmed by that uh, health wise. And uh, by not having a voice, you have um, reports that come out that don't say anything about the impact of the environment on the health of these people, the harm. There's no connection to it. There's no obligation by industry or business to change. And so it is business as usual. And that let's just go ahead and do it. These people don't have a voice. Um, no one is looking or no one is making us have one, but for the Federal Department of Justice, the Attorney General's office and others uh, looking into the Coke plant, the people in Erie were even unaware of the degree of their violations or the harm uh, that they were exposed to. And, uh, and so um, it's a continual thing. So the, as you say, the degradation of the environment and the uh, just pollution in itself, they continue to happen. And uh, bigger than the more symbolic to Erie's environmental justice community than the Coke plant is the McBride Viaduct and just the history, the symbol of what happened there. And, uh, and it's the byline of the bigger uh, environmental uh, concern or impact, which is the uh, planning and implementation of the Bayfront Highway and what it has done to the minority community of Erie, Pennsylvania, and how it has divided the community and locked into neighborhoods that were already poverty stricken to giving, making them even more, um, less accessible to jobs and to transportation. And that we're, uh, we're skunks and possums and deer and rats and uh, you name it, everything you could think of that would come out of around the city sewage plant. And, you know, all that rail line or, and wooded area, uh, into the neighborhood of these same people with no voice. And so what 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 is needed to really come into existence is more than just words of diversity and equity and 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 uh, and inclusion and justice uh, to actually add this word of voice. It's you know what we're saying about community engagement and that it has to take place. It can't be around those just pockets of the Coke plant when the whole minority community of Erie, Pennsylvania has been impacted and affected by it. So you can't have a plan from just engagement around the Coke plant. It's, it's surrounded by agencies and organizations. The people have either been killed or moved out in that. And, uh, and so the impact is citywide. You know, it's not just to that neighborhood. If you and and that and so when you look at even the the challenges of the of the GE refrigeration site, uh, the BASF site where they're closing down and moving out, Accuride's daily uh, violation of the air quality, and that because they have a dysfunctional e air emission system, and and uh, people look the other way, or you have to wait till uh, permit time. And that to 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 really have some unless the government acts and that on the information that they have, whether it's the, the government at the local level or the state level or the federal level, the people most impacted have the least power. And then when they want something done, like the fight to save the McBride viaduct, who's listening? No one's listening, you know, and that. And so it seems as if uh, you're in a no-win situation. And, uh, and so um, it, 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 when you look at as, uh, as, as, as at the total totality of that challenge and the little pieces that uh, are toward the neighborhoods of people are trying to have a voice, we need an eerie plan, a plan for eerie, where we mobilize all those voices around the broader minority community in, uh, in the city because they've all been impacted and not just the little isolated uh, efforts of outreach around where the latest activity appears to be made. 
or, or to be being done. And so I think with um, with um, our air and um, our future and clean air and clean water and HECA and the Benedictines for Peace and the Sierra Club and the experts from Penn State Barron and Mercyhurst and Gannon uh, and the Sisters of Mercy and the Sisters of St. Joe's and you know all the people that the Sierra Club and everybody else that has been involved in our stakeholders uh, effort have contributed to teaching the community what environmental justice is and that because they've all been doing it in that uh, in sometimes in their own silo. But um, a few years ago, the regional office of the Environmental Justice uh, Commission where Allison and I'm throwing the ball over to her and that where they um, uh, have a regional office, they reached out to us and, uh, and the Sierra Club, and they they wanted to know what are the areas of concern in your neighborhood or in your city, and that and uh, can we convene a stakeholders group to talk about these things, and that and it, so it's actually helped us educate our community uh, what environmental justice is. We're learning it on the job, and that we can't afford not to learn it. We can't afford not to do it. It's right now, and that uh, you know, and uh, and with. Um, Again, it's a great opportunity, a new administration at the federal level, um, uh, a new look, you know, a new year, you know, a new opportunity to give people uh, the thing that no matter what you do, if you give the people voice in it and that they, they, they won't come out of it with no jobs, no job training and that and uh, less access to the jobs harmed more than benefit from um, the rebuilding or the restoring or the, you know, because if you're not at the table, you don't have a voice. And then you can't even, you know, my involvement in this, when I'm approached by the Sierra Club, I made them promise that we're not just going to be looked at as fighting. And then how do we get to the table where we can uh, have fair exchange with these uh, owners of these, these industrialists and these people that are making these decisions that don't see themselves as, uh, uh, as uh, uh, responsible for our neighborhood and that where we're not engaged with them, no discussion, no conversation, and that where they might find out we have a lot more in common. They can help us a lot better, you know, than just doing what they do, you know, and that. And so I see with, even with all those challenges, we have great opportunity right here before us because we have a more conscientious local community. We have a state community um, and, 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 and officials on the federal level with the new administration going in. We have an opportunity to put a plan together for Erie, an Erie plan, you know, a plan where we can really see that diversity, inclusion, and equity are not just mere words. And uh, that some people, they roll off people's lips too easy and that, but you, they can't point to where, they're, where, where it really is and that they can't show you what it looks like, you know, and that. And so with that, I'm going to throw it to my friend, uh, Allison, who's, who's been an asset uh, to us because, you know, sometimes my passion is perceived as angry or against and that now nah, she's helped me soften some of that up. And that, and uh, because she believes that we should have a voice, and she has uh, provided us with the resources and the tools and the opportunity to have that voice through the services that they provide on the state level. And I'm happy to work with her as a member on the Governor's Advisory Commission for Environmental Justice. It's over to you, Allison. Thank you, thank you so much, Gary. I just wanted to um, echo one thing um, before I get started. I'm uh, sharing my screen now, but just want to echo one thing that you said and that um, Sarah said, is that it, it's really important for the community to define your issue around environmental justice. And just finding that as we go and work in different communities, that all communities are unique. And what may be environmental justice or defined as environmental justice in Scranton may look different than what it is in Erie. And it's very important for communities to define environmental justice um, on their own and really, really develop a, a community framing about what the what the definition of environmental justice is. So, I, I also echo the that there 
the community, again, once it defines environmental justice, focus on a plan around environmental justice. So I just wanted to provide some framing. I'm not sure if everyone knows what um, environmental justice is in the state and kind of our role in the Office of Environmental Justice, but want to provide some framing around that. And um, starting with some definitions of environmental justice that are broadly used uh, and, and really to explain what environmental justice is, both within the state, but then at the federal level also. The EPA has, and you can read the, the definition, but the key tenets are fair treatment and meaningful involvement. As Gary and Sarah both say that people have to feel like they're meaningfully involved in a process or else it, it, it doesn't resonate and doesn't call people to participate. So fair treatment and meaningful involvement are key tenets of environmental justice. And then also environmental justice em embodies a principle that populations should not be disproportionately exposed to adverse environmental impacts. Now, this is something uh, PADP actually doesn't have a, a definition of environmental justice, but this was adopted by a working group in, in 2001 framing what environmental justice should focus on. And I, that's a, an I, a, ideal and it's aspiration for us to think about how we get to address disproportionate impacts. And then another um, focus, another area of focus for environmental justice was established at the First People of Color Environmental Leadership Summit in the early 90s, but there were 17 principles around um, environmental justice established there. And at the bottom, there are elements of a taxonomy of environmental justice. So environmental justice includes distributive, procedural, corrective, social justice, and structural justice. And, and this, um, folks have seen, many folks have seen this equality, equity, and justice. We want to uh, really get to environmental justice involving systems change and getting at some of the inequities that um, both Sarah and Gary talked about and how policies were administered or established. And, and um, the justice really gets to, to changing systems. The equity deals with how people achieve a goal by giving them what the needs are. And then equality kind of gets us to a point where everybody gets the same thing, but they're not achieving the goal. But we wanna get to and think about um, justice and how we dismantle systems of oppression and then repair some of the historical inequities. And this is the same thing, actually redlining, which is a really um, has layers of environmental justice challenges um, within it. But I also, in addition to Sarah sharing the map, just want to show you how things were actually graded and actually verbatim survey or description of the red line areas in the 30s. So the, there are certain communities that were designated as hazardous communities, but you can see that it says um, odors and noises from local industries and infiltration of covered in orientals. And I'm reading that verbatim. So just wanted to show you that there, there was a link between adverse or hazardous areas and um, segregation and having people of color move to areas that were hazardous. We can even see now um, the EPA, Region 3, did an analysis of EJ Screen, which is their environmental justice tool with um, some Pennsylvania areas. And the two examples shown here are Philadelphia and York. So they overlaid um, EJ Screen indicators with redlining maps. And you can see in Philadelphia, 48% of the block groups that meet the 90th percentile or higher for the EJ, um, EJ screen index for EJ index for diesel particulate matter are overlap with red line area. So it's um, about 48%. And then in York, 82% of the groups that meet the 90th percentile or higher for hazardous waste proximity are um, overlap with red line area. So you can see that these practices from the 30s impact uh, environmental conditions today. So these are an overlap with situations today by the EJ screen. So just wanted to um, present a, a timeline of federal and state government responses to environmental justice. And um, environmental justice has been, the, the beginning of it, at least in the US, has been traced to the 60s civil rights movement. But the, the um, most notable start of it was in 1982 in Warren County, 
which dealt with the, the county protests uh, of a landfill in that county, but resulted in national attention, um, multiple arrests, and then the, the phrase environmental justice being used. And in red, you can see the different framing around what's happened in PA. So in 1990s, the Chester Community Advocacy kind of birthed the, the Pennsylvania movement. And then our office was actually created in 2002. And then our public participation policy in 2004. And then we've had listening sessions. And then um, actually the, the, the thing is not on here, I realize now, is the new executive order that focused on climate and environmental justice 14008 from um, President Biden ju just issued a, a few weeks ago that really advances some things around environmental justice, geospatial um, mapping, and also just talks about the, again, the interagency work happening around environmental justice, talks about a dedicated unit in the, um, and the Justice Department around environmental justice. And so um, it's really, really, really good framing for environmental justice. And the Justice 40 initiative that focuses on 40% um, of benefits from financial programs going to communities that are, are um, vulnerable, communities that have been most impacted by, uh, by, by environmental hazards and climate. So um, this, this talks about AJ and the relationship to, to civil rights and there's Title VI is a, is a key civil rights bill. But the, what I wanted to focus on, we talked a little bit about the roots of environmental justice in PA. So it's really important for us to talk about the history of environmental justice in, in Pennsylvania. And it focuses on organizing Chester in the early 1990s. And then a lawsuit that was brought by, um, by Chester then, which was 8% of the county population, but 60% of the waste facilities were in uh, Chester, which is a predominantly African-American uh, at that time in 1996, 70% African-American. So really thinking about the, the burden that Chester um, had to, to um, hold within environmental, around environmental justice, and they sued DEP, and the suit eventually became moot for another procedural reason, but this suit was a result and kind of engaged people that at the state and said, hey, we have to really address environmental justice in some way. So that's how environmental justice got um, started as a state agency. Environmental justice concerns were going on before then, but the, um, the work group again started in 1999, recommendations in 01, and the, or the office started in 02. And just a little bit about EJ and the Office of Environmental Justice. Our office kind of works towards the overall DEP mission to protect air, land, water from pollution and provide for the health and safety of citizens. And then a, another key part of our mission is working with partners for individuals, organizations, government, governments, and business. And it's really critical that you, we all understand, and we understand it at the state level, that we are a partner in really um, working this, this out. DEP is among several other agencies, and our agencies are among several other partners kind of working to, to support communities. So if we take that lens, we, we often think about, is, especially in our office, what we can provide or what our role is as a partner. So it's really, that part, part is really clear. And our, our goals established in the working group were minimizing adverse environmental impacts. We're really thinking about how to do that because we heard again, Sari, Sarah, Sarah and Gary saying that we have to think about communities that have had these, have been burdened year after year with environmental hazards and how we address that. and. I'll explain a little bit later that our EJ policy doesn't get to that. And we have to think about how we start to think about getting to um, supporting this disproportional impact uh, question. But empowering communities, we help to empower communities, communities empower themselves. So we can help through education and um, supporting really active engagement, and then by uh, fostering economic opportunities, really support where we can resources to communities through our office or through partnership with other offices. And 
really that happens by us integrating EJ policies into the department. So we're thinking about how we change policies to get to this disproportionate impact question ultimately, and how we strengthen public participation so that people have an active voice and then building tools and resources for EJ. So this is um, our EJ public participation policy is this one tool. We really have to think about what it means and what we want it to mean. So it was created in 2004. It provides essentially a enhanced public participation. So for certain permits that are deemed such as such because of certain environmental or health hazards and different programs, if we, and then others which we opt into, if you're in an environmental justice area where there are 30% people of color and or 20% um, low income, as, as um, Sarah mentioned, then our office can, can be assist and then provide additional information, resources, or um, meetings and things like that. And I think one of the, the questions is kind of what does that Kind of that, that meeting or the additional public participation get. And it really, it, it supports communities, but we want to think about supports communities and understanding a situation more and getting information out or fostering dialogue. I think ultimately New Jersey's law, which really considers um, cumulative impact in the permitting process is a place that is uh, much more meaningful for communities. But in Pennsylvania, it's a, a bit challenging to, to get there. Um, Right now, we'd have to in, enact legislation to, to, to make that happen. So the, the public participation policy is one that we're revising now. We want to move beyond public participation, but understanding the limitations on getting to cumulative impacts, we want to think about how we can infuse EJ consideration in other areas, such as formally doing something in the grant context uh, and ensure that uh, grants speak to or prioritize communities that are um, disproportionately impacted to really think about inspections and enforcement and, and think about how we might be able to frame some policy, uh, a policy around that, but broadening the, the policy so it's not just based on public participation, but really ensuring that that's a core piece, but thinking about other places where we might be able to, to think about environmental justice. So. Our, I'll talk a little bit more later, but um, just want to mention, we have an environmental justice advisory board, which advises us, our, our agency on environmental justice and meets quarterly and Gary's on the EJ board. Again, we have interagency collaboration. Wanted to mention the public participation roundtables, which hopefully we'll do one in Erie. Um, we are going to get a new staff person soon, hopefully, I'm not gonna mention any names because um, this, hopefully everything works out. But next month, we should get a new Western Region Coordinator for Environmental Justice. And we would like to, there was some interest in having a roundtable in Erie. So if there's folks are interested, we can, um, we, we have that on our docket. We just want to make sure that there's a, a person who can um, really attend to that fully in a way that's, that's really useful. So, but these public participation roundtables go back to the point of establishing different priorities for environmental justice in different areas. So that they, we've had about nine listening sessions and each, each community has defined EJ in their own way. So for instance, in Sharon, PA, the issue was um, fishing and, and eating fish that were um, contaminated fish. In Shemokin, the issue was blight and brownfields. In um, Harrisburg, the issue was education. And these are all environmental justice concerns, but distinct among each of the communities. And the, the round tables, our secretary comes and community group organist representation happens and folks get to talk to the secretary directly. So um, these are really a good opportunity to engage the secretary in kind of talking about what, what some concerns are from EJ at the community level. And in Chimokin, we were able to help that community and make a recommendation with our Brownfields unit to get a small community planning grant to uh, address planning around blight and brownfields um, in that community. So it's been really, really helpful. And this is just one of the roundtables. Um, as you can see, like I said, the secretary was there. And then 
these are the participants. So um, there's state government, local government, and it's the others that you don't see are like the community <laughs> and um, uh, other, other people. And then again, here are some of the outcomes um, just with the Shamuka Roundtable. We've had similar roundtables in um, other places. And we had like a consumer advisory sign. That's what folks wanted to uh, do not eat um, fish advisory sign, which the DEP actually paid for. And just wanted to um, just uh, emphasize the benefits of community engagement that it's really critical for us to learn local knowledge. And it, it, by engaging with the community earlier, we kind of, we, we minimize per delays in the permit process and develop relationships with future partners. Just want to mention our EJ viewer, which kind of talks, which is a environmental justice tool from PADEP and it tells the um, EJ areas. Uh, it talks about what EJ areas and, and as Sarah mentioned, you can put in a particular address and it'll tell you whether or not you're in an EJ area or not. And, are able to work with our office. And EJ Screen is a federal tool. I'm going to skip through all this. Um, and of course, we know about public participation. But then uh, just want to mention that our office is a resource. We can uh, help both uh, uh, provide assistance as you're thinking through issues. Uh, I like to say that the people in our office are good at um, providing additional cap capacity when we talk about environmental justice issues. Uh, then we can connect to other state agencies. We have a six agency, seven agencies, including DEP, uh, Interagency Council around Environmental Justice that was started. And then um, we have a newsletter, EJ News, which um, talks about a number of EJ opportunities. Lastly, I just wanna say that our EJ policy is being updated. We're gonna start with some community engagement sessions next month and want to hear from people about what you think should be included in the policy. Again, we have some limitations around how we're able to get to cumulative impacts, but want to hear about what else should be in the policy. How do we do public participation better? But we're working through this year and early next year, and all of this information is on, uh, on our website. So we want to provide some opportunities for in input before we even draft it. We're providing a public um, opportunity for public hearing, which we didn't do the last time we were moving through this process. And then also we'll, we'll provide education in, in around, the, around the policy um, afterwards, after we, we finalize it. But in March, it's just general feedback, not on the policy, but just wanna hear from um, folks and everything is virtual. So really good time to engage. And then this is our office right now. Again, we're gonna get somebody from the Western region, but just wanted to, to share, we have an Eastern region and Central region coordinator and then me. And uh, we're really now focused on trying to think about ways to really meaningful, meaningfully engage communities. We're in the process of supporting our office with several key initiatives and engaging communities around REGI, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. We've just implemented and they should be posted soon equity principles around Reggie and are working to ensure key uh, key places where communities can be involved as we think about Reggie um, moving forward and advancing. And that's it. So Allison, I wanna thank you. That was so much to go through so efficiently. <laughs> I don't wanna say quickly, but efficiently and in, in all that you covered. And, and, and I wanna thank Gary and I wanna thank Sarah as well. And I, I wanna jump into some questions. We've got some from the audience. Uh, I've got some uh, after hearing all three of you speak. Allison, I've got to start with you. You just put out a big call for feedback, people to get involved. So remind us again, taking a look at the EJ policy uh, timeline, you're asking for the feedback right now. Where do people go again? How do they participate in that? So right now we haven't, so right now up to this point, we've been kind of figuring out what we're doing. <laughs> so in March, we're gonna post it next week. We're gonna post kind of these community feedback sessions. And we wanna hear from people, where are we messing up? Like, what, what do we need to do right? This is before anything is drafted. So we're actually like listening to hear from folks, what do we need to include within our, our policy? So we will announce it this week on the website of DEP, uh, Office of Environmental Justice. So we're, and so right now, if you look at it, you'll see that chart that I just put up. You'll see that, and we're gonna announce some sessions for next month. 
um, next week. So we will all stay tuned. Thank you, Allison, for that. Uh, all three of you spoke about uh, community engagement and community involvement. And so, uh, Allison, on a state level, I'd like to hear what the, the DEP is doing. And then I want to turn to, to Sarah and Gary. Uh, Sarah with uh, Penn Futures work and, and Gary, the work you're doing in the community. How do you get the buy-in for communities that, you know, have been or, you know, feel ignored for years, if not decades, to finally feel like there now is a space at the table, welcoming them to this conversation, asking for their input, getting the buy-in. How do you build the trust? And so, Allison, if I can go to you first, I'm curious what the DEP is doing to start those conversations with the various roundtables you've already had and how you're building community engagement. And then, Sarah and Gary, I want to turn to you locally. How do you get that buy-in? How do you build that trust? So it's a long-term proposition. Like, you don't go in. I think one of the things folks have to realize on the state level, and I come from, I'm working in a United Way context where one of the core things that we focused on was um, community engagement and relationships. And it just takes up some time. Like, we are not able to, any state agency or anybody is not able to come say, we want you to participate in this, and then everybody's going to run and participate. So we have to be involved, as Gary saying, uh, involved in the long term. And, and that's why it's so important to have somebody who's connected to the, the region to be able to participate in things in an ongoing way, and not just when we call people to do something. So that if people want to call, they can call our office, and then we can talk about things. And then if we aren't able to help, we aren't able to help. But then if we are, we can maybe find resources. So just understanding that it's long term and that also people need to feel like they're vested in this process in some way that their voice makes a difference. So that that's one of the reasons, for instance, why we're doing um, sessions before the actual policy is created to ensure that we we get good feedback and we're able to listen to it. Thank you, Allison. Gary, I want to go to you. How are you working on, on the buy-in, the trust building, getting the community to the table to participate and be a part of this process? What does that work look like for you over the years? And what are you doing now? How might that have changed? The newer, softer, uh, Gary Horton, as, as you, you acknowledged. Well, I think uh, people want to see action. They believe actions speak louder than words. And uh, so, um, and I was... Uh, uh, reminded through both of the ladies' uh, slides that the environmental movement was rooted in the civil rights movement. And uh, the civil rights uh, challenges continue today. And uh, so it's not like it's over. And I think you have to, you have to agitate and advocate and uh, you have to illustrate you have to do direct action. You have to write letters. You know, you have to do peaceful demonstrations and, and silent marches. And uh, we, you have to, uh, outreach is a two-way street. And that where you're being ignored, you gotta, you've got to try to go in and sit down and, and, and uh, give them the benefit of the doubt. Hey, our, our neighborhood revitalization group over there is meeting on such and such a day. And that can you send a representative to come come talk with us? And that you gotta you gotta uh, follow the uh, legal ads for when the government or the companies have to put out something. Their permit is up, or you know it's a comment period. When the, you you have to pay attention to when people say, "Let us hear your opinion." <laughs> you know you gotta you gotta go ahead and express it. So you've got to employ all of those things. And I think. Uh, all of them to some degree have an impact on giving people confidence and building trust and that, that the status quo uh, is not just gonna be continued, that their voice really has a likelihood of being heard. And whether you change minds or not, what a lot of people would just, just hear me out, you know, give me an opportunity to, you know, to say something and, and that, and uh, show us that we care. I mean, that you care. And that don't just drive the bomb truck, the bomb train through our neighborhood every night or all day and don't tell us, hey, that train's loaded with bombs. If it rolls off the track over there, it could wipe out your whole neighborhood or the chemicals that are on it. Don't just keep treating us like that. 
Gary, I can't help but think of uh, a piece that we ran a while back in the Erie Reader that took a look at what was being transported through Erie and, uh, you know, the, the audience response to that of not knowing what was being freighted through the community and how dangerous that that could potentially be. So uh, you've absolutely got a point there. Sarah, I want to go to you and, and, and ask Penn Futures, but I'm, I'm going to fold this in with an audience question here because um, this person's uh, saying it's so important to make environmental justice a consideration in community planning and decision making. The common agenda for clean water makes some suggestions suggestions for doing this. How can we help to see that these suggestions and others are implemented? Yeah, I think that um, coming together, so I would say, you know, get in touch with me. I'm happy to include anybody. You know, we had 12 partners on the common agenda, but I, I will take more for any of the efforts that we're, we're going for. I think that there is power in numbers. Um, and so, yeah, just get involved. I think eventually what we're going to do, and, and like I said, we just published this common agenda in December, um, is, is start to meet with our elected officials to say, here are the ideas. But I also think it's important to, to for, for us, for Penn Future and our partners to recognize that those are just a few recommendations and, and every situation is, as Allison pointed out is different. And so we really need to have conversations um, we really need to make sure that we're not just talking about these neighborhoods um, or telling these neighborhoods how we're going to, to help them, but going to the neighborhoods and including residents in the conversation right from the start, um, bringing them, bringing people with us to participate in these conversations and help shape the way that shape the policies as we move forward. So I think getting engaged um, and, and going with us to, to meet with elected officials. Um, yeah, and, and showing support that way and sharing new ideas too. Allison, you've got yeah, something to I say. Just want, I just want to add in Philadelphia a couple of years ago, they passed environmental justice legislation. So just really thinking on the local level, where the, whether there's any will, and Sarah and I, I think talked about this, whether or not there's some will to pass legislation that focuses on environmental justice that encompasses either like a county level or, or a city level um, and then kind of framing what some of the issues are there. And I was just on a call earlier today talking about, um, it was a just transition US Climate Alliance call about again, legislation that addresses some of these equity issues and then through either legislation or advisory committees or advisory bodies writing in language about equity and justice so that it's ingrained and it doesn't like, in when the person le uh, person leaves or a new administration, but really thinking about some local level initiatives that um, that may be put in place. And, and I think that speaks right to the ability of policy to outlast politicians. Politicians might not always be in office, but if we get smart policy, that can be enduring. That can have a stickiness that uh, maybe we don't have as people in terms of the roles. And I can't help but think of Sarah's earlier mention of uh, Erie County declaring racism a, a public health crisis. Uh, looking at uh, trying to deal with environmental justice uh, for a place like Erie, Pennsylvania, that faces additional challenges, one of those being our economy, and thinking about about opportunity for development within the community and thinking about growth and welcoming new businesses. How do we navigate that? Because I think sometimes people see that as an either or, either you take the business or you protect the environment. So how do you start to engage in dialogue of companies saying, we wanna move into your region and set up shop. How do you engage them in this process to see how they're bought into being good stewards of the environment and, and practicing environmental justice? Allison, I wanna to go to you first and then I'll, I'll turn it to Gary and, and Sarah. I think one of the slides kind of referenced it, but if the communities are engaged early, it can be a win-win for both the community and the um, entity, because I think ultimately um, they're trying to really serve the community. And there's a way to think about these issues uh, in a way that's not confrontational. We have one of our EJAP members who, who passed away, John Waffenschmidt, worked for um, Covanta, but they have developed a corporate environmental justice policy, which uh, would be good to probably share around and talk um, to, to, to corporations or businesses in Erie that talks about the benefits of the policy of finding uh, people from the community to be employed at the company, to working with supporting the company 
and then developing goodwill and being at the table when there are other decisions that are being made. So I think it's a matter of uh, collaboration and everybody may not agree all the time, but at least coming with a framework of transparency and collaboration will help and benefit the community in the long term. Thank you, Alice. And Sarah, I want to go to you. How do, how do we have that dialogue between new development? Because we're looking to attract businesses, we're looking to create jobs, but at the same time, we're looking to be good stewards in the environment. How do we do that locally? Yeah, um, I think the, a focus on sustainable development is really important. Um, I think that Erie needs to have the courage to have high expectations too. Um, we are a Great Lakes community. We are, you know, the, the residents in this community deserve to live in a clean environment. Um, and, and we need to kind of own that, own that identity, I guess. Um, and if we own that and we become that and we have high expectations, then the companies who want to come here are going to want to fit in with that, those expectations as well. Um, so, so that's kind of what I'm thinking. And I, I, as kind of a specific example, one of the things that comes up a lot when Erie is talking about revitalization is attracting young professionals and keeping young professionals in Erie. Um, one of the things that young professionals are looking for are communities that are dedicated to sustainable development and communities that are um, committed to addressing social and racial inequities. And so I think that's this, this quality, this commitment, this, these high expectations um, that you know, if, if we set the bar higher, then we can, we can reach that and maybe surpass it. Gary, to you, same, same conversation. How do you balance that? How do you get that com conversation, communication going between development, new corporations, companies moving in, good stewards of environment? Well, I can say this, that however it's being done now, it's not working too well. And if we look back at hearing that question and seeing that challenge been around longer than some of us are old in that. So whatever we've been doing is not working to date in that. And uh, sometimes you have to do some, do legal challenges against them and that. Because again, uh, the people have the courage to believe the people have the courage to have high expectation and that they're generally challenged when they have a high expectation that the responsible people have good intentions and will do something and that. And so right now, the people's trust level ain't too working too well because action and words is so different and the people don't have the power if they don't have a voice their power is in their voice. And so we need to see a win. We need to not just to have a policy against racism on paper that you can't see no benefit to it other than it looked good on paper. Hey, y'all here in Pennsylvania did this and that. So we do need policy. No, we need a plan. A plan mean more than just a policy. A, a, a policy is incorporated in a plan. You know, plan mean you know, we going somewhere. We ain't, just, you know, and that. So whatever we're doing right now is not working. And that, and so the activists have got to be double down. And, uh, you know, because that's the one thing we don't see a lot of. Our good intentions, it's not working too well. And that's what I hear, Gary, there is action. You, you've gone to that word several times. We need to take it to action. So Allison, I want to turn it back to you. And in terms of Pennsylvania, are, are we, uh, is, is the Keystone State a, a front runner? Are we middle of the pack or do we have some catching up to do? When it comes to state level initiatives, where are we if we can benchmark it honestly? But then who do we look to? I mean, is it Pennsylvania leading on this? Is this the forefront? We need to connect and have a good conversation local to state to continue to work on this. Are there other states, other areas that uh, are worth observing that are scalable models that uh, might make sense for Erie, Pennsylvania? So we as a state, uh, I think we have to improve our, how we think about environmental justice and incorporate it into the work that happens within DEP and other state agencies. So um, New Jersey is a good um, benchmark having just passed the legislation around environmental justice. We meet with New Jersey and actually Delaware EJ offices, but they're, they're um, you know, we, we have some work to do and we also have to think about building data around environmental justice. So right now we have the 3020 rule for EJ areas. We have to think about how we can use data and um, health and environmental data to describe that, like what these 
areas are. And the Department of Health is working on um, a e environmental health mapping tool that will have some of these indicators, but uh, we have some work to do. New Jersey is, is a good state to look to. So all eyes on New Jersey will turn there. Allison, I already pressed you on this early of how do we get involved? What do we do? Because you put out the timeline and the call for communication. I, I want to go back to the audience and I'm going to turn to Sarah uh, because here we have somebody asking in the audience, uh, how do they get involved? Uh, what can the citizens of Erie do to support the common agenda for the region? Sure. So I would say start by contacting me. They can send me an email. That's probably the best way. Bennett at penfuture.org and that's Bennett with two N's and two T's. Um, and I can, I can help either connect to a group or um, just include in our communications, you know, to, to say, hey, you know, join us when, when we're doing something. Um, so yeah, I, I, email's definitely the best, the best route for me. Fantastic. Uh, you can also go to penfuture.org to learn more about the organization. And they'll, they'll find the common agenda there. We're almost out of time, uh, but Gary, if somebody's in the audience saying, I hear you, I hear Gary Horton, and I want Gary Horton to hear me, how do we get that conversation started? How do they help the work you're doing? How do they plug in? Uh, I think the most important thing they can do in the short term is to uh, is uh, make those, that, those points to their local elected officials. And my, everybody's running for office. There's an election in May. Have your voice, put environmental justice on your agenda, on your list of concerns and, uh, and the questions that you have. And if you wanna reach me, you can reach me at, uh, at uh, uh, uecdc.org and uh, Reverend Ernest Franklin Smith's Quality of Life Learning Center or G Horton at uecdc.org. And uh, Gary, that's a fantastic point about local elections, local officials. Uh, we saw a market voter turnout in the 2020 election. We get excited when it's somebody at the top of the ballot. If it's all the way up for the president, we turn out. Municipal elections, just as, if not more important, because it's your day to day, it's your neighborhood, it's the people that govern the policy and, and, and put forward the plans that impact your life. Okay, final question before we sign off here. And uh, Allison, I'll start with you. Then, Gary, I'm going to go to you and Sarah. I'll give you the final word, Pen Future here. For somebody watching and, and wondering, okay, what are the next steps? What can they do as an average citizen other than finding more information, plugging in? Uh, what recommendations for takeaways do we have? for this? What should they pay attention to that they've heard today uh, that they need to keep in their mind, they need to think about, they need to reflect on, and they need to, to look more into that? What would you recommend of all the things we heard today? Allison, what's the most important thing coming from you? To really think about what happens, you know, get all of our information, but really think about what happens locally. There's just so much information and so much that goes on at the local level that impacts environmental justice, like zoning, land use, and things like that. But to, but to stay involved both at the local level and stay connected, stay involved and stay connected because there's so much that happens. Um, and lastly, I recommend thinking about a statewide environmental justice organization, which we do not have. But, you know. <laughs> Great recommendations, stay involved, and, and we're going to get that as well. So Gary, over to you. Take away a most important thing. If they're to take one thing away, what are folks focused on that they heard today? Two things, vote <laughs> and your voice. Ask questions, educate yourself in that. Get involved, make environment uh, an uh, item on your agenda. But in the end, make sure you vote and make sure your voice is heard. Two very important Vs. Mr. Horton, I thank you for that. Sarah, I'm going to give you the final word. Most important thing uh, that you think folks should take away from what they've heard today. Sure. I think um, uh, I'm going to have two things also. So first of all, I think if you're at a position where you're organizing something or you are making decisions that are going to impact people other than yourself, stop at the beginning of that process and say, who's going to be impacted by this? Are they at the table? And if not, let's get them to the table. Um, so including people. And then the last thing I'm gonna end with is listen more, engage people, engage as many people as possible and empower people who don't, who maybe haven't historically had power to make sure, again, that's part of bringing them to the table to make sure that we have um, stronger policy, we're making inclusive decisions and, and we're moving forward in a much more sustainable way. 
I appreciate all of you. I heard local, I heard voice, I heard vote, I heard listen, I heard so much. I appreciate it. Our audience does too. I'll read just one that says, thanks all, great ideas, invigorating discussion. So uh, Penn Future Campaign Manager, Sarah Bennett, uh, Gary Horton, uh, Urban Erie CDC President and President of the Erie Chapter of the NAACP, Allison Acevedo, Director of the Office of Environmental Justice at the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection. Thank you, thank you, thank you for sharing your knowledge, your insight, your expertise, your experience, taking the time, energy, and effort to share them with us here in this digital program. Thank you. Uh, Sarah, for folks, um, uh, again, Penn Future, we got penfuture.org, uh, Allison, uh, DEP website, where folks can uh, tune into to what you're doing. DEP.pa.gov. Fantastic. And Gary, one more time, your website as well. UECDC.org. I'm getting yes. good at reading the lips. I appreciate <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it. And folks, head over there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, folks, for tuning in to watch, uh, whether you were tuned in real time live watching this program on the JES Facebook page or you're watching or listening to a later broadcast. We thank you. These conversations could not happen without you. Friendly reminder to stream other JES digital programs on demand. Head over to our website, jeserie.org. You're also going to find details about upcoming programming there, as well as a whole ri wide range of publications. Quick, timely read. Uh, reports, essays, and more, all available free to download. And be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. For the Jefferson Educational Society, I'm Ben Spagan. Be safe, be sound, and thanks for listening and learning with us.